Well, good morning. Well, let me start off with this this morning. You guys know that uh, this is not the place where I normally hang out. And uh, this is not the pulpit that I hang out at. My uh, pulpit is at the Baltimore Rescue Mission and at the Ordnance Road Correctional Facility when I go into the prison and over at Chick-fil-A when I meet a lot of folks over there and back in my office back in the counseling room. So this is kind of a unique experience for me to be able to preach in the pulpit. Dr. Cassidy asked if I would speak. I told him that I would. I said, but I was a little stretched by this. But I have to tell you, I was talking with John Long on the way in this morning, and he says, John, Jim, it's just like being at the mission. Up there, they've got three girders that hold the place up, and we, as you stand in the pulpit and preach, it says, preach the Word of God, preach the Gospel, preach the Bible. And so that's what I pray to God that I'll do today. And I have to tell you, as I look up at the windows here this morning, the more I look, I kind of see bars on the windows, so I'm feeling a little bit comfortable in here this morning. <laughs> My friends, let me uh, ask you a question this morning. How do you deal with the daily ups and downs of life? In other words, the journey that we're on. I got to believe if I ask you that question and then ask you to respond publicly this morning, I would get many different answers to that question. Can I tell you, first of all, I believe that my spiritual life is an event, not a process. I believe my spiritual life is a marathon, not a sprint. Additionally, can I tell you, the Bible tells us that we need to run this race and throw off the things that slow us down and not focus on God. But God wants us to focus on Him and how He is making us more Christ-like. You see, that's the goal that God's going for every day with every person in every situation in life. Can I ask you guys this morning, if you would just help me, let's let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning and ask Him to just kind of Bless us and teach us from his word today. Lord, how we thank you that, and ask you that you would please meet us this morning, that you would teach us from your truth about life's journey from the living word of God. We ask, Lord, as we see ourselves in the reflective mirror of God's word, that you would show us and change us into the people of God you would want us to be. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I recently read of a story about a young man who was in the fourth grade. It was their field day at this young man's school. We all know about the field days. Many of us have attended those. And where there were various events, and one of these events that was going on that day was the 440-yard run. And this young man at eight years old entered into that race. Now, i got to believe that a kid being eight years old really didn't understand how huge of a race that was. I'm sure that when he got into that, that he found out that the 440-yard run would be like you and I the first time saying, hey, I think I'm going to go out and do a mile. So before the race, there was kind of an upperclassman who knew the young man who was going to do the race. And so the upperclassman went to the younger fellow, and he told him, he says, listen, I want to give you a strategy that he had used in one of his previous races. And he told the young lad, he says, listen, He says, when you start out in this race, he says, I want you to conserve your energy. He says, don't start off running. He says, just sprint. Then the last 125 yards of the race, you run as hard as you can past everyone else because they're going to be tired. His friend that day was Dave Woodall, who was the 1972 Munich, Germany Olympic champion of the 800-meter gold medal winner in the Olympics. This young man thought to himself, well, if it worked for him, it might work for me. And it did. Even though the young fellow didn't win the race, he came in second. But he said, you know, I ran a good race. And it was the first time that I ever had a plan for running a race. My friends, this morning, we too will be talking about running our race. And yes, we too will be focused on running a good race. In fact, the race of our lives is more specifically our journey of faith. And let me say to you, I believe our journey will will go much better and and be more transformative in our life if you and I have a plan as well. We must also realize we not only need a plan, but we need a plan coupled with a tremendous, a tremendous amount of endurance in this race. You see, my friends, this race is the race that God has set out before each one of us. 
And God tells us in his word, the Bible, to run the race, but to run that race with endurance. And that race that's been set before us, God set a race before us. That word of endurance is an interesting word. The word endurance is a word which means to remain under. In other words, have staying power. Go all in. Go that extra mile. Don't quit attitude. Let me ask you this morning. Now, to be honest here now, we're in church. How many of you guys ever ran a race? Now, I'm not asking how many people have run across the street or down the hallway or ran to get a hamburger. I'm talking how many people have ever ran a 5K race? Anyone? A 5K? How many has run a 10K? How many has run a marathon? One. Isn't that amazing? But life's a marathon. This morning, I want to tell you about an unbelievable race. This was a race of amazing endurance. I want to tell you about a fellow who ran a race and how he had planned well. You see, he needed to really plan well because this was a grueling race. This is a true story. This man ran a race of almost 535 miles. And it was a race from Sydney, Australia, to Melbourne, Australia. It was the longest and toughest ultra marathon anywhere in the world. In 1983, 150 world class runners converged on Sydney, Australia for this event. And on that day, <laughs> that race, a toothless 61 year old potato farmer, shepherd named Cliff Young, approached the registration table wearing his overalls, his galoshes over top of his work boots. At first, the people thought Young was just there to watch the race, but very soon, to their surprise, they found out that Cliff Young declared his intention to run the race and requested a number to participate. You see, my friends, Cliff Young had grown up on a farm without the benefit of any luxuries of horses or four-wheel drive vehicles, so when the bad weather rolled in on his farm, Mr. Young had to get out, and he had to head out and round up his 2,000 sheep on his 2,000-acre farm, on his feet, and sometimes he had to run those sheep down for two or three days at a time. The, the speechless staff at the registration, the registration table couldn't believe their eyes, but nonetheless issued Cliff Young the number 64. As Cliff Young mingled with the other runners at the starting line, soon some of the spectators, they just couldn't believe their eyes. And they mused to themselves, they, this must be a joke, this guy's crazy, this old guy's going to kill himself. So when the gun went off, the bystanders that were watching the race just snickered at Cliff as he was just left behind in his galoshes and overalls as the other runnies in their sculpted bodies and professional running equipment just briskly ran away from him. But very soon, the snickers gave way to laughter as Cliff began to run. You see, he didn't run like the rest of the other guys. But Cliff ran what only could be described as a leisurely, old, odd shuffle. And all of Australia just kind of became riveted on Mr. Young in live telecasts as they watched the scenes unfold. Many in the country kept saying again and again and again, please stop this old guy. He's crazy. He's going to kill himself. Well, I'm going to tell you, five days, 15 hours, and four minutes later, Cliff Young came shuffling across the finish line in Melbourne, Australia, winning the ultra marathon. Let me tell you, Mr. Young didn't win the race by just a few seconds or a few minutes, but his nearest competitor was nine hours and 56 behind him. Cliff Young, Mr. Cliff Young, the Australians were stunned at this seemingly impossible victory, and many of the folks says, how in the world did that happen? Well, it happened because everyone else who ran the race, everyone knew that you ran the ultra marathon race the way you ran that race is you ran it for 18 hours, and then you stopped and you went to sleep for six hours, and this is the routine that you repeated for five punishing days until you completed the race. But see, someone didn't give Cliff the postage note or send him the email because that wasn't Cliff's strategy. That was the strategy everybody else used, but for Cliff's strategy wasn't even close to what those guys were doing. You see, Mr. Young decided that he was just going to continue shuffling along all day, all night, all day, all night, without sleeping, 
and utilizing his plan, Cliff broke the previous record by nine hours and became an overnight uh, national hero. You see, Cliff was just an ordinary guy who did something that you look at and you say, that's absolutely extraordinary. So think about that. What happened was extraordinary. Let me challenge you this morning with what I think is another amazing moment from an ordinary to extraordinary person. <laughs> there was a fellow that I know, Dr. Cassidy and Pastor Steve and I and others from this church had been down to his church in North Carolina. Dr. Stephen Davy is the pastor of Colonial Baptist Church in Cary, North Carolina. Dr. Davy wrote uh, about something he read about the 16th century reformer Martin Luther. Pastor Davy said that Luther had once commented that, the, uh, that God had created the world out of nothing. And Dr. Davy said when he thought about that statement, he thought, well, you know, my own life, the fact that I'm nothing, I wonder, well, perhaps God could do something and create something out of my nothing life and do something amazing as well. Can I tell you, what a work, doc, what a work God's done in Dr. Davy's life there at Colonial Baptist Church and Shepherd Seminary where they have training some of the champions there for Christ there in Cary, North Carolina. So the question this morning that I have for each of us, is it possible for God to take an ordinary life like mine and yours and do something extraordinary as well? But you see, my friends, I see God taking ordinary men and women all the time and doing extraordinary things in their lives. I, I look at the Word of God and I just look at the apostles, fishermen, Remember those guys? They were just ordinary guys with God. And they turned the world upside down. My friends, just like Cliff Young was victorious through his plan and great endurance, victory comes to the Christian through a life with a plan and great endurance as well. So my friends, let me remind you once again that life is not a 100-yard dash. It's a marathon. You see, in the short distance, we need speed. But in the marathon, it's all about endurance. That's what leads to success. And God tells us to run that race that's set before each one of us. And each one of us must race, run the race that's our, ours. And we need to read, run it in our own special way. Yes, with the talents. Yes, with the gifts and the abilities that God's given us. And yes, even the disabilities that God's allowed us to have. Today, I want to take us to three verses and look at three verses from the book of Hebrews. If you got your Bibles, if you would turn in your Bibles this morning to these verses that are just filled with athletic terms and running images. But beyond these images are some, of, some concrete guidelines for how to run a race, how to run your race. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, where it says these words, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witness, let us throw off Every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us, let us run with perseverance, or some may have endurance, the race that's marked out before us for fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter, the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. He says, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners against himself, that you and I will not grow weary or lose heart or become discouraged. My friends, did you notice that this passage begins with the word, therefore? Therefore means to look back to the verse that preceded that verse. However, in this case, it wasn't just the verse that we need to look back to, but we need to look back to the beginning to the whole chapter of chapter 11. If you see chapter 11 refers to and is often called the, the faith hall of fame. Chapter 11 chronicles the faithfulness of many generations of men and women from Israel's past who had run their race. Very quickly as we look into chapter 11, if you will, starting in verse 4, notice by faith Abel. Verse 5, by faith Enoch. Verse 7, by faith Noah. Verse 8, by faith Abraham. Verse 20, by faith Isaac. Verse 21, by faith Jacob. Verse 22, by faith Joseph. Verse 23, by faith Moses. 30, by
By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. Verse 32, or 31, Rahab the harlot. And then you have verse 32 talking about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Japheth, David and Samuel and the prophets. My friends, here's what I believe the writer of Hebrews is saying about who these great cloud of witnesses are and what they're saying to you and me today. I think what they're saying to us is, guys, you always need to have a big view of God. Let me say that again. We always need to have a big view of God and God's word. For if God's word and God is big in my race, then my problems in my life's journey will not dominate the conversation. However, if the voices of my problems become bigger than my God and the word of God, if I allow the voices of fear and anger and self-pity and discouragement and many other voices that are in the marketplace of life to consume my thoughts, then these thoughts, my friends, are going to take me to some very dark places in the race of my life. My friends, the Apostle Paul wrote some amazing words over in Romans 15, verse 4. If you want to turn there real quick, Romans 15, verse 4, it says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance, there's that word again, taught in the scriptures and the encouragement that's there as well, that they would provide that we might have hope. Can I tell you, can I tell you that these guys, these folks in, in chapter 11 want you and I to know that a life of faith is a life that wins. They want us to know that it's true not only in the day-by-day activities when everything's rocking and things are going my way, but they want us to know when the roof blows off the house and the bottom falls out and you come to the end of yourself, when life becomes so challenging and disappointing and hurtful, and yes, even at the face of death that touches our lives, even then, even in the moments as I look in chapter 11, there were people that walk by faith, that never saw their prayers come to be answered, but they trusted God from afar, knowing that God eventually would answer their prayers. Challenging to me. Church, please listen. These examples that have been given to us in Scripture, this is not just small stuff. This was the lion's dead, the swords, the war, the persecution. It was crisis after crisis. It was a life of faith that won. My friends, we too are also living witnesses that you and I can run a race with endurance as well. You know that we can do that, and God will honor us in the end. Can I just tell you, if you don't have this verse marked down in your Bible, you probably want to underline this one. This is something I hold on to when life comes and there's difficult challenges. It's it's Hebrews 13.5. Many of us know it. We've known it for many years. God tells us that he will never, did you get that? Never leave us or forsake us. You see, God is always in, all the way in, in our life's journey, no matter where we're at. What a promise, amen? So God, guys, in chapter 11, there's an exhortation to live life and run a race. And I can almost see these folks, they're standing on the sidelines of our lives, kind of cheering us on. They're saying to you and I, based on, Faith. They're saying to us, don't quit, guys. You can run that faith. Listen, based on the faith that they believe, God went through crisis after crisis to victory, and so can you and I run that same type of race as a testimony of those witnesses. Look at them, one after another. I'm just so challenged by their lives. Think about Abel. Abel, right through the crisis of hatred through, from his own brother, Noah, the crisis of a generation of people who just laughed laughed at him, mocked at him, and scorned everything he did. Abraham, the crisis of being promised a nation and didn't have a son. Crisis after crisis after crisis. The stories and the lives of Isaac and Joseph and Jacob, these folks and others, they just keep coming. It's like the valley of tears. They keep standing up one after another. And you can almost hear them shouting from the sidelines of the racetrack. These folks are saying, please hear me. The life of faith, the life of faith, friends, is the only way to go. We put our faith and trust in God, and God came through. What an amazing testimony these saints have left us. It's like the writer of Hebrews is saying to all the Jews. To some of them, he was saying to the Hebrews, he's saying to them, hey, bro, Get in the race. Now, I don't want to date myself, 
but I remember a couple of years ago, do, do any of you guys remember the radio uh, preacher? His name was Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Can I see? Yeah. Do, do you all remember what Dr. M Dr. McGee used to say? I, I used to love this. I kind of chuckled to myself. He used to say these words. Church, you need to stop singing that old gospel hymn, standing on the promises while you're sitting on the what? Sitting on the premises. God says, if you're going to stand on the promises, get in the race. He was also challenging the folks to get in the race that he had called. And many of these folks didn't even know they were called and needed to be in a race. I also believe there were people that were there that uh, he was writing to that had got to a point in their life where they had heard the gospel over and over again but they had never put their faith in Jesus Christ. These were the folks who were just hanging on the fence. So the question is, what's up with that? So let me ask you today, friends, how are you doing in your own spiritual journey today? Are you one of the guys that are standing on the promises and sitting on the premises? Well, I've got some words of encouragement for you this morning. Get in the race. Or are you one of the people that doesn't even realize that God has you in a race and, and, and wants you to run this race with him? If you didn't know that, now you do. Again, I got some words of encouragement for you, get in the race. Or maybe you're one of the folks that are here this morning. You say, you know, Pastor Jim, I've never even put my faith and trust in God. I'm not saved. I don't know Jesus Christ in a personal way. Can I tell you? I believe one of the most important things that I could ever do in a sermon would never be to go by an opportunity to give somebody an invitation to trust Jesus. You agree with me on that, church? I think that's the most important thing. So I, I want to stop right here in the service in, in my sermon today because if that's you, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, the most important thing in this sermon is to take a moment and give you the opportunity to trust in Christ today. And I would ask the rest of the believers here to join me in prayer for that one person that's sitting here today that doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I tell you, God tells us we're all sinners. We're all separated from God. There's only one way to receive that wonderful gift, and that's through Jesus Christ. Simply put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That he, he shed his blood for you. He died, went to a cruel cross. He was buried and rose in the grave. And when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, God will give you the gift of eternal life. I want to pray very quickly for that one person that might be here today. Lord, church, pray with me. Lord, I just pray for that one person that's here today who has never, ever put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. I pray the best way they know how today, they would acknowledge, yes, I am a sinner. Yes, I am separated from God. And Lord, the best way I know, I'm just simply going to trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of my sins this day. And I pray this now in Christ's name. Amen. I want to go back to the message. And, and I, I want to say I'm so glad to know what the passage says about these great cloud of witnesses. But I also want, want, want was told that we need to throw off in that passage, throw off everything, every weight of sin that hinders or ensnares us. In other words, throw off the sins or the s sinful habits that slow us down. You can see in the image of this passage, if someone is preparing to compete in an athletic contest, you need to tech off those extra clothing. The warm-up suits just kind of cast them away. But not only the clothing needs to be removed, but you need to remove some of the extra weight, and some of us need to shed a few pounds of the habits that we've been carrying around for a long time. And that takes a day-by-day -day accomplishment of making changes in the day-by-day. -day. My friends, you and I know the sins that so easily entangle you. You know the ones that you're dealing with right now, the ones you struggle with in your thoughts, the words you struggle with in your words, the words you struggle with your deeds, your bad attitudes, the things that need to change, and how they're hindering your walk. So in light of that truth, can I also ask us a couple of questions this morning if you're still struggling with trying to figure out where that's at? Let me ask you a qu three questions here. What or who is hindering your spiritual journey today? Number two, what or who pulls you away from Christ? Think about this third one. In the marketplace of life, who or what's, whose voice has preeminence over Jesus Christ? Now, let me continue. Could I ask you to do something as well, church? 
if there are people or circumstances or situations that have a dominating voice over you following God, I would say to you, in those areas, we need to get that right this morning as well. Amen? And so I would challenge us just in a brief moment here that we would take a moment of confession and say, would you pray with me, Lord? I just pray for myself. I know at times, God, how I struggle in my journey. And I just sense that all of us, Lord, at times struggle. And we need your grace and forgiveness. I see Lamentations 3 where it says, your grace and mercy is fresh and new every morning. Well, that tells me I need it every morning. And so I'm asking this morning for my brethren here that you would give us your grace and mercy and forgiveness, fresh and new, right here, right now. This morning we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Continuing on in the Bible, the Bible says, let us run that race with perseverance, that race that's set before us. I want us to look at a couple of words in that verse there. It says, the first word is it, perseverance or endurance. This is a, a unique word, hupomene. It means to remain under. The second word that I want us to say, it says, run the race. And that race is kind of an athletic metaphor which presents itself as a faithful life, a life at times that's demanding and it's grueling and it takes tremendous effort. This word race in the Greek is where we get our English word. It's amazing, agony. So Pastor Jim, let me try and understand what the writer of Hebrews is saying. While I'm running the race, knowing the race to be demanding and grueling and agonizing, I still need to remain under during those times? Well, yeah, that's what it's saying. I want us to notice something. In Isaiah 43, I've been challenged by this passage a number of times. It says, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you'll not be burned. Did you notice he didn't say the words, if you go through the waters, if you go through the rivers, if you go through the fires. It says, when you go through there. Folks, as everybody here this morning has lived that difficult time. Maybe you're here this morning and you're living that drama here right now. Maybe that drama came into your life on the way to church this morning. My friends, we all know the times that we've felt so weak and lonely, frail, the biggest failure in life, sinful, broken people. And at times we see ourselves as just a sick pilgrim in a weary land times we even feel like a stranger on the earth. I, I've often read in Isaiah 59, and it says there's times in Isaiah 59, it says we find ourselves looking for light, but there's only darkness. For brightness, we're looking for that, but we only walk in blackness. It says we grope along the wall like a blind man. We grope as if we had no eyes. It's like we're up against a mountain and we see no way out. The writer of Hebrews says these are some difficult moments in the race that is run that we need to run that's been set before us by Jesus, who's the author and the perfecter or the finisher of our faith. Folks, that means, again, in the journey, get a big view of God, and that big view of God begins the moment that you put your faith and trust in Christ. When we receive the gift of his Son, Jesus Christ, we receive the gift of eternal life by faith. We begin to see that each of his children in this life are between the already and the not yet. Already saved, but I'm not yet in my eternal life. The new meaning of the race takes on a different meaning when we see that we're between the already and not yet. Because God is perfecting us in our faith by our day-by-day -day journey. Yes, even in the good times the bad times and even in the ugly times because God's preparation is preparing us for the ultimate destination which is heaven these times are where God does some of his most perfecting work in the children of God and the question for us this morning is in that time of journey that time of preparation what and how does God want us to respond to these preparational times with people and circumstance and situations Matthew 22, verses 37 through 39, it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. God tells us, love God and love your neighbor. And many times in the race of life, folks, we get the opportunity to help other people. And at other times, there's folks 
that get to help us. Can I just tell you, I need you guys in my life. I need your prayers. I need your words of encouragement. I need your help. I need people putting their arm around me and walking up the road. And I got to believe you do too. In that vein, I wanted to share with you, last September, Peggy and I celebrated our 49th wedding anniversary. We set out on vacation for a number of weeks, and we set out with a goal, a goal to see 49 cities and talk to 49 people about the Lord. And we wanted to share with them about how faithful God had been to us over the last 49 years, and we prayed that God might give us that opportunity to introduce people to Jesus Christ and to help them become his devoted followers. I want you to know this trip was an amazing trip. We traveled thousands of miles. We went to 56 cities, and we talked to 46 people about the Lord. And Peggy and I watched the Lord over and over and over again, opportunity after opportunity. Just it was a humbling experience. We praise God for those precious moments. And as I share just a few of those moments with you here this morning, I want you to know something. I, I don't want to exalt Peggy and I. That's not what I'm sharing here this morning. But I want to exalt my God for allowing us the opportunity to do this. And if you've never done that, you pray that God will open doors for you to minister to people, and you watch how God does that. The Lord Jesus is amazing. Can I tell you, it was such a privilege to see his hands in the lives of his children. May he be praised this morning. I tell you, we became very aware that life's races of other people, what they were living, it seemed as though every person had a story. Some were funny. I can tell you about, not today, a lady asked me about, Pastor, do you handle snakes? And I said, yeah, in the other building. <laughs> some were encouraging and some stories that just absolutely broke our hearts. They involved heartache, sickness, people suffering, addiction, eviction, separation of families where people didn't communicate with each other for years at a time, death of family members, and there was a church leader who was just absolutely heartbroken over the loss of a friend of an overdose. He was so perplexed and angry with the pastor because the pastor didn't preach the gospel and give the people that were there that needed such hope. He didn't give hope, and this fellow was just broken. So we were just thankful and joyous <laughs> and meeting another young couple who were married for two years to give words of encouragement to that. Another fellow we met was just praising God. He was an older fellow who was thankful that he had the opportunity to take care of an elderly man, and that provided him a place to be able to live. Each person we met was so special and such a blessing. And there's this one young man I want to tell you about here this morning, and I've changed his name. I want to tell, call his name here this morning. His name is David. And uh, we met David, who worked in one of the local attractions in one of the stores. David worked there while he was going to school. See, David told me that he was in Bible School Seminary, and I asked him what brought him to Bible School Seminary, and I told him that I was a pastor. He told me that when he was 10 years old, that someone had sexually abused him, and his life became a train wreck. On so many fronts, he said, Pastor Jim, I've been living a lie. I let shame and guilt consume me. There was confusion about my sexuality. I was seething with anger towards God for allowing all this to happen. You can only imagine the turmoil this young man had gone through. But then he told me, he says, I've lived such a dark life for a number of years, but God in his grace and mercy put a godly man in my life to help me. This godly man loved me. He listened to me. He cried with me. And he led me to Jesus Christ to, to receive the love of God. And he shared the gospel with me. And this young man got saved. He was 26 years old. And God was restoring in this young man's life what the locust was eating. God was transforming this young man's life. David asked me, he says, Pastor Jim, what brought you and Peggy to the attraction today? <laughs> and uh, I told him, I says, well, you know, we had such a desire, we wanted to visit 49 cities and talk to 49 people about Jesus Christ. And each day, we began our day in prayer, asking God that he would pe put people in our lives that we could just or needed to be able to be talked to. And so, David, David, today, I believe you're our answer to prayer from God. I asked David, what did he believe God was doing with him in Bible school or seminary? And he said to me, Pastor Jim, he says, you know, that's the question I've been wrestling with for a long time. I, I don't know. I told him, I said, David, I don't presume to know the mind or actions of God, but I want you to think about something. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, it says these words, friends. Praise be to God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of all compassion, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those with the same comfort that we ourselves have received from God. I said, David, just maybe in the same, same way that God puts someone in your, time, in your life in that desperate time, maybe God has put you in school to put the tools in your toolbox so that you could be that same godly man to another child's life. I told him, you know, Dave, there's a lot of Davids out there. There's a lot of kids that are broken and need the kindness and understanding and grace from someone who really knows and has lived the hurt but really knows the beauty and freedom of the gospel and is free from the bondage of sin and that and knowing Jesus Christ. And I prayed with him, and we left to say, that was a profound emotion. I can't even keep it together. It's a profound emotional moment. It would be an understatement. In conclusion, I want to challenge us. Maybe the difficulty you're going through today. Maybe God wants you to be that person to bring comfort to someone else. As we travel, I know young ladies got some pictures up here. I wanted to share this picture with you here this morning. As I'm getting close to the clock, this was a picture in Utah. The picture I wanted to share with you this morning was... It's kind of about the race, and I've shared this photo with a number of people here in this church, and uh, these folks have told me, Pastor Jimmy, you need to share these photos with other folks. One of the people I shared with is my friend Dick Olney. I think probably Dick's here. I'm not sure, but Dick and I are friends. We meet every Monday morning for two hours over at Chick-fil-A. Dick and I have been meeting with one another, praying with one another, talking about the Lord with one another, just growing in the Lord with one another. And Dick's given me permission this morning to share with you about how these photos impacted him. And I, I'm sure you'll see a connection point in just a moment. As Dick saw these photos, Dick saw things that challenged him and encouraged him. Can I tell you, this first picture is, if you see all the way back, there's mountains way behind the large things that are, uh, the large mountains that are there, that in the very far distance, about 60 miles away, but where those you can see are over 30 miles away, and we're standing up on the road. And many times as you look back way down there, and I've drilled down on some of these pictures you're going to see in a moment, many times the reality of the race begins in the valleys of life, and the road is very rough and rugged with many obstacles. And in that roadway that you can barely make out there, when you drill down in that picture, a lot of that picture is severe ups and downs. And some of the road is even washed away, and the road's blocked, and sometimes the road is blocked completely, and, and it is in that road. And sometimes you got to get over in that desert area. And can I just tell you, that desert area is just filled with rattlesnakes and scorpions. And many times, it's like climbing up a huge mountain, huge mountain, on a road with many twists and turns, even to the point where it's so dangerous, if you're not given full time and attention, the journey becomes so intense. Let me tell you, at that one little place where you can see right there, that turnaround right there drops off about, I don't know, 2,500 feet, just on the pathway. If you're not given attention, it, you're gone. It's kind of like that in life. If you're not given attention before you know it, you can be in the ditch. And yet there's, or <clears throat> it, it's amazing, and yet there are the times we come to when we come to the end of ourselves at a complete dead end, absolutely no place to go. You see that ledge out there and that wall? You see, that's where my friend Dick Alling told me. He says, Jim, that's exactly where I was seven years ago. Dick said, when I sat down and I got the, got the diagnosis with my precious wife Carol's diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what to say. I was at a point of desperation. I just couldn't get over that mountain. I didn't know what to do. Even my son came to help me, and I rejected his help. He says, I got to make that right. Dick, I bet I want to tell you something. Dick got to a better place. I want to show you the next photo. If It's there. See, God got him away from that up against the wall and put him on the road. But he allowed Dick to only walk so far because the next picture will show you down in the corner is there's the road takes you between the rocks to the point of what you just don't know what's coming around the next corner. And that's kind of where our life is. We walk by faith and not by sight. But you know, my friends, in the end, we see our lives. We can look back and see God's handiwork 
in the race many times, but we're captivated many times by the pain and difficulty. Can I tell you, church, I want you to listen in those moments. Don't quit. Today, you might find yourself up against the mountain like Dick Olney did with almost no place to go. No way out. But God still tells us to walk by faith and not by sight. God tells us to remember with him all things are possible. God tells us, my friends, we're in a great race. We're in a great race with a great God who's doing a great work to take us to a great place. So let me say again, don't quit. Keep running the race. God will make a way. I love this verse. Psalm 31, 15 says, my times are in God's hands. Can you think of a better place to be? My times are in God's hands. I'm going to close this morning with the words of a hymn. I want to ask Dave Moritz. Is Dave Moritz here? Dave's here. I want Dave to come and accompany us. And then as I read the, this hymn to you, I'm sure it, it is a hymn that's uh, film, familiar to many of us. I want you guys to sing the chorus with me at the end, but I want you to hear the words of uh, this song. Sometimes the day seems long. Our trials are hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur in despair. But Christ will soon appear to catch his bride away, all tears forever over in God's eternal day. At times the sky seems dark with not a ray in light. We're tossed and driven on, no human help in sight. Oh, but there's one in heaven who knows our deepest care. Let Jesus solve your problems. Just go to him in prayer. Life's day will soon be o'er. All storms forever past. We'll cross that great divide to glory safe at last. We'll share the joys of heaven. A harp, a home crown. The tempter will be vanquished. And we'll lay our burdens down. Charlotte, can you put that picture up here? And folks, would you all sing that song? It will be worth it all. Sing it with me. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trial seems so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrows will erase. So great. Sing it one more time with you folks. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trial seems so strong when we see Christ. One is all Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. We pray, Father, we would run that great race with a great God who does a great work that will take us to a great place. Perfect us, Lord, into the people of God you want us to be. And may we praise you every day of our life, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.